So I'm going to move on to chapter 11, in which he describes how, I mean, his basic, he, he starts out chapter 11 by saying that language originates as an idea, right? In the beginning was the word, right? This is, this is the quote from the beginning from the Bible. And he's, he gives us with this phrase, this, this idea that the human brain actually began not through kind of biological evolution, but in fact that it begins with an idea, with uh, the beginning of a kind of symbolic processing, which is re really saying that some sort of pre-hominid kind of ape-like creature had this idea to do something, set up this idea, and it's that idea that then created the pressures for the evolution of the human brain. And the idea is that um, the that the invention of a symbolic system could have been an easy symbolic system, right? And so um, he's trying to imagine a simple symbolic system that some kind of ape-like creature would have set up for some reason, and that would have been an idea. That's something, an idea that, that an ape would have had. And then by setting this up, it would have created a set of behaviors um, that, it, that themselves exerted a kind of selection pressure on brain evolution. And so the, he, he, and, and he refers then to this idea of Baldwinian evolution in which a kind of behavior then changes the type of environmental constraints on further biological evolution, therefore changing the course of the biological evolution, right? So this is, this is, this is a mechanism why, whereby, you know, a, a particular creature in changing its behavior, has a, can have an influence on the bi future biological evolution, right? So he, he gives an example of dolphins, for instance, as sort of land land mammals that sort of tried to <coughs> that started using the water more and more, and as they use water more, more as a behavior, they use water more and more, or in it were in the water more and more. It it had this effect on their bodies to change their bodies to adapt to the water, and so what he's saying here is that. He's saying that there must have been some kind of ape-like creature, kind of like chimpanzees, that had that same initial capacity to use simple symbols, who had the idea to use some symbols that then became um, advantageous for the survival of those creatures, and that that um, behavior itself then influenced brain evolution to match or to, 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 to help make symbol processing easier, right? So, so that's his, his, his basic thesis here, right? And um, he defends it first by indicating the way in which universal grammar itself cannot uh, develop through natural selection. And he, he, his argument here is that symbol processing um, creates a separation of these symbolic associations from indexical associations. And this separation means that the specific symbolic relationships, such as grammar, can't provide indexical correlates that are necessary for genetic change. Because you know, what, he's, what he's indicating is that genetic change requires really, in fact, indexical correl correlates. Because it, it really requires that there be uh, a kind of constant type of um, influence on the creature um, that, that would be felt and that, that would then um, become a selection pressure. But, you know, what, what happens is that universal grammar has this deep, is, is sort of the deep structure of language. It's not the surface structure of language. It's not the, the, the obvious things that you see in language. And those obvious things that you would see in language are actually precisely those things that are then um, programmed sort of eventually into the neural circuits as, 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 as children grow. And it's those things that would have a chance of being sort of, um, you know, genetically programmed, but it's precisely those surface aspects of language that are not part of universal grammar, that, that, are, that are variable, that change from language to language. And so the universal grammar, it's this deep structure that you never see on the surface. And because you never see it on the surface, it's never going to have any um, precise correspondence to uh, ne neuron arrangements in the brain. And so this universal grammar then therefore can't be, can't exert any natural selection pressure because it doesn't have any 
um, kind of morphological, any kind of uh, biological, physical uh, correlate in the brain, right? Um, so, you know, so, so you know, he's, he's, he's basically showing us the way in which a, a genetic predisposition requires a kind of constant um, pressure for change that would function in, in, in an indexical way, not in a symbolic way. Okay, so <coughs> what he then moves to then is this idea that the only kind of inner language ability that humans could have then has to be the general adaptation for symbolic processing, right? It can't be any specific grammar or any specific rules of grammar. It can only be um, the ability to use symbolic reference itself and that can be easily selected for because it's basically selecting for that uh, increasing size of the prefrontal cortex as a sort of a general thing that then can be, you know, uh, developed individually within each individual creature, but on a sort of biological genetic level, the only change that has to happen is that that prefrontal cortex needs to be allowed to grow longer or, or larger um, than in other uh, primates, right? So, um, what he's indicating here then is that this small change in uh, this relatively small change in, in genetics could have happened not through a, an initial biological change, but could have happened then through a symbolic change, a sort of behavior change, that could have been um, accomplished by primates. So he, he goes back to this, um, um, this idea that animals themselves, or you know, primates, so he goes back to sort of the, ch the chimpanzee experiments to indicate that the, the basic learning pattern that you need for symbolic processing is something that these primates already had, right? And so, um, you know, <laughs> he, he points to the chimpanzee experiments. He also points, though, to foraging patterns in, in animals, and particularly in primates, that, you know, that who, who eat fruit, for instance, and are constantly foraging for fruit. If they're doing that, there's this skill that they need in, order, in which they have to hold sort of things in short-term memory, but in order to then um, do something different than what that thing in the memory indicates to them, right? So if they, if they picked a fruit from one place, they kind of have to hold that place in their memory, but not as a place to get fruit, but at a place not to get fruit, right? So they're, you know, they're, they're remembering it you know, you know, the initial thing is that, you know, they remember it as a good place, right? Um, and if they're using just sort of a, a kind of purely indexical type of learning, then they would just go back to that place over and over again, because that's, that's the good place. There was a correlation there. But obviously, once they've picked the fruit, there's no fruit there anymore. And so they have to remember that place, but then remember not to go to that place. And so there's this, this is the type of skill that's necessary for learning symbolic processing, and primates already have that skill. So there's a, there's a kind of sense in which primates already have, in undeveloped form, kind of the prerequisites for developing um, this kind of symbolic proce processing, right? And so that's what indicates to him um, that, that the primates could have done this in the beginning.